Hello. Who is this? Was Cindy James's seven-year nightmare nothing more than a cry for help? Or was it a haunting reality? While police argued that she made the whole thing up, Cindy's life was left in her hands until her mysterious and tragic death. Could her haunting story of a stalker gone wild have ended with the ultimate price? Only one thing is certain. The truth behind Cindy James and her perplexing death will leave you with more questions than answers. Did she simply disappear or was something far more sinister at play? Early in 1982, a young woman reported almost a hundred incidents of physical assaults, harassment, and stalking. The police would spend over $1.5 million in investigations, all inconclusive, which led the police to speculate whether the victim was making it all up as she had a history of depression. The victim, a beautiful blonde girl, insisted she was being stalked, and while her family believed her and stood by her, over the years, authorities became doubtful. Until 1989, when 44-year-old Cindy James was discovered dead. Welcome to the Detective-verse, where we travel into the universe of solved and unsolved crimes and mysteries from all corners of the galaxy. Born on June 12, 1944, in Oliver, British Columbia, Canada, Cindy was the fourth of six children, with three elder brothers and two younger sisters. Her father, Otto Hack, was a former Army colonel from the Royal Canadian Air Forces and was working as an English teacher. Her mother, Matilda Tilly Hack, was a stay-at-home mom. When her father was serving in the Air Force, she spent most of her teenage years in Ottawa. As per her journal, her father was incredibly strict, which cast a dark shadow over her life. Cindy's father believed in disciplining his children by force, which included hitting all his children frequently. Cindy pursued nursing and started attending nursing school in 1962. Her father was called back to the Air Force, which led her family relocating to France. Cindy visited over the holidays and semester breaks. Cindy often wrote to her family, and in those letters, she mentioned she was dating an intern from school. She even claimed the two were engaged. But in a dramatic twist, the man found out he had cancer and was terminally ill. Not long after, the two went on a skiing trip where he killed himself. The bizarre conditions about this story wasn't just the circumstances, but the fact that Cindy never named her fiancé. No one in her family ever met or even saw a picture of this man. A few years later, in the summer of 1965, Cindy met a South African psychiatrist, Roy Makepeace. He was 18 years older than Cindy, but the age difference was not an issue as the two hit it off immediately and started dating. The two would eventually tie the knot and get married on December 9, 1966, right after Cindy graduated from nursing school. Her father strongly felt that his daughter had been taken advantage of, and right away the family felt the marriage was a troubled one. The couple appeared distant, and Cindy accused her husband of domestic abuse. Roy, however, denied the allegations and claimed he only slapped her twice. The casual tone suggested the psychiatrist didn't find it a big deal. Roy failed to obtain his medical license in Canada and therefore could not practice as a psychiatrist. He settled for a job as a professor assistant at the University of British Columbia. Cindy started working as a pediatric nurse at Vancouver General Hospital from 1966 to 1975, following in the footsteps of her husband, who had also worked there. In 1973, Roy got a job as the Director of Health Services at BC Hydro. Then, in April 1975, Cindy was hired as a team coordinator at Vancouver's Blenheim House, a facility that cares for children with behavioral disorders. She worked there for about 12 years and was known by her colleagues for being kind and proficient at what she did. Cindy and Roy had a rocky marriage from the start. The two eventually parted ways in 1982 after 16 years of marriage. Cindy confessed to her co-workers and friends that Roy was an abusive partner and had become increasingly violent. Four months after the divorce in September of 1982, Cindy told her friends she saw someone sneaking around her house at night. From October 7th, she received several phone calls with intense breathing, obscenity, or threats. 
On October 12th, she received a more threatening call. The caller whispered in a low, evil voice, I'll get you one night, Cindy. Upon reporting the phone call to the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, the officers advised her to keep a list of the calls and a log if the calls continued. Police thought this would be a good idea to figure out a pattern of behavior or something that would give the perpetrator away. According to Cindy, as soon as the officer left that day, she received another menacing phone call. The night prowler seemed agitated that she had involved the police and started hurling obscenities at her. The next day, on October 13th, she was called again. A few days later, Cindy reported that someone was lurking outside her home at night. The following morning, she found her porch light smashed in. She also reported someone had thrown a rock through her window. She suspected they had entered her home, although there was no evidence. Things escalated on October 19th when someone slashed a pillow on her bed. It had gotten out of hand fast, which was alarming. It meant the woman was truly in danger. The problem was, so far, there were no footprints or other evidence of the stalker. A constable of the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, Patrick McBride, suspected Cindy's estranged husband. While Cindy maintained that he was incapable of harming her this way, she had confessed to her friends and family about his violent nature. These conflicting statements made it hard to pin the crime on Roy Makepeace. The next day, on October 20th, the tenants who rented Cindy's basement reported they heard someone walking around upstairs after Cindy left for work. Her neighbor also told Officer McBride that she spotted a man standing outside the house, and he had even entered the gate in the front yard at one point. According to the neighbor, the man did not resemble Roy at all. This was crucial. It was the first time someone other than Cindy had reported a sighting of the alleged stalker. During this time, Cindy and Officer McBride began dating. The recently divorced McBride moved into Cindy's house. A few days after moving in, McBride saw someone sitting in a parked car in the alley behind Cindy's house. To his surprise, it was Roy Makepeace. Roy stated he was trying to catch Cindy's stalker in the act and drove off after he found out McBride had moved in. By November of 1982, Patrick McBride had also received a phone call while Cindy was with him. He believed the calls were made from an airport terminal since he could hear a woman over a PA system in the background. However, the call was traced to an exchange in Vancouver. In the same month, Cindy found a note on her windshield which was a picture of a corpse under a sheet. McBride then found her phone line slashed in five places. Cindy had parted with Roy on good terms. Roy often visited to discuss her stalker with McBride. The men got along well, and both really wanted to catch the stalker. Cindy and McBride eventually broke up sometime in 1983. On Christmas Day, Cindy found a photo outside of her home of a woman with her throat slashed. This incident really made Cindy terrified as it seemed it was a threat. Agnes Woodcock, a friend and colleague from Blenheim House, visited Cindy on January 27th and was shocked to find Cindy unconscious in the backyard with a nylon stocking strangling her. When Cindy came to her senses, she told Agnes that she had been attacked from behind and while another man was waiting in the garage. She also accused these men of sexually assaulting her and threatening to kill her younger sister, Melanie. He told me many times that he wanted to scare her to death. She said, he doesn't want to kill me. He wants to scare me to death. However, doctors found no trace of any physical assault. When police suggested a psychiatrist to help with the trauma, Cindy declined. She was afraid this would permanently label her. The following month, Cindy moved to West Vancouver, and within a week she received a letter that read, Run, rabbit, run. I'll show you how good I am. Soon, bang, bang, you are dead. By April of 1983, Cindy had changed houses again. Meanwhile, Roy was trying to make amends with her to get back together. He bought her expensive presents and even paid for her plane ticket so she could visit her brother Roger in Indonesia. Cindy changed the color of her car, changed houses, and even hired a private investigator. Anything to get to the bottom of the situation. She wore a portable panic button and always kept a pepper spray with her. Things took a turn for the worse between October and November of 1983 as she discovered the remains of three strangled cats in her garden. They were each bound with rope. Her investigator, Ozzie Cabin, believed she wasn't divulging all she knew. 
Her mother believed it was because the stalker kept threatening to hurt her family. Authorities remain speculative. This stalker kept edging closer, but never revealed themselves. Could it be that Cindy was simply a victim of mental illness? Co-workers at Blenheim House reported receiving phone calls in which the stalker did not speak. The following January of 1984, Cindy was discovered by Ozzy when he heard strange noises on the two-way radio. A knife had been stabbed through her hand, and the woman was unconscious on the living room floor. Once Cindy regained consciousness, she said she had been injected with a drug. However, when tests were run, there were no drugs in her blood. Yet her polygraph tests showed she wasn't lying. Police suspected Roy was involved in some way, but he denied any allegations. By June 1984, Cindy's dog Heidi had been physically abused as Ozzy discovered the dog hiding in the basement with a rope similar to the ones used to strangle the cats. Cindy's mother once spent the night at her house and stated the women were tormented by a stranger walking around the house and ringing the doorbell during the night. The window near the front porch was found to be cracked in differently places, but no signs of forced entry were found. Around the same time, Cindy was allegedly attacked while walking her dog. She described her assailant as a bearded man who drove a green van with a woman. Cindy was found four hours later in shock with a nylon stocking tied around her neck. While she was being given medical treatment at the hospital, the receptionist reported that a man had called to inquire about the hospital's security policies. When she heard an audio of Roy, she said it was very similar. In January of 1985, Cindy alleged under hypnosis that her ex-husband had murdered and dismembered a couple when they were on vacation on Thor Manby Island. Her sister, who had been with them on the vacation, said she found nothing sinister. Six months later, by June of 1985, Cindy was admitted to a psychiatric facility after attempting suicide, which she insisted was not her intention when she overdosed on tranquilizers. When she was released, she received several threatening notes. There were several fires started in her home, which the police suspected Cindy started herself. Cindy moved houses again and changed her name from Makepeace to James in an attempt to hide her identity. In April of 1986, Cindy's parents were both visiting when a fire erupted in her basement. Her father ran outside and spotted a man. He told the man to call the police. However, he turned around and fled the scene. In August 1987, Cindy began working at Richmond General Hospital as a nurse. On August 28th, her home alarm alerted her to a broken back window. And on August 31st, she reported to police that the light bulbs on her front porch had been tampered with. In the following week, Cindy informed authorities about a hole in her basement window which was made with a glass cutter. On October 11, 1988, Cindy's ex, Roy, received strange voice messages on their home answering machine. The message featured a hoarse, muffled voice. Due to distrust in the Vancouver police, Roy gave the answering machine tapes to his lawyer, fearing he might be considered a suspect. The Royal Canadian Mounted Police enlisted Robert Chisnall, a mountain climber and knot expert, to analyze the knots on the nylon stockings used to bind Cindy. Chisnall concluded that it was highly unlikely Cindy could have tied those knots herself. In January 1989, Richard Johnston, a life insurance salesman from whom Cindy had purchased a policy, moved into the basement unit of her residence to provide added security by having someone else live with her. After an alleged break-in at her home on April 29th, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police used scent hounds to track the presumed intruder but were unsuccessful in finding a trail. On May 10, 1989, scent hounds were deployed once again following another reported break-in and they successfully tracked the scent of an unknown individual that led over the backyard fence of Cindy's residence. On May 25, 1989, seven years after the craziness all started, 
stalker or no stalker, Cindy James lost her life. That day, around 4 p.m., she picked up her paycheck from Richmond General Hospital, commenting to a colleague about how there had been no suspicious activity for almost two weeks. She deposited her check around 7.59 p.m. at an ATM. Cindy had scheduled an infrared detection system to be installed in her home that day and had plans to play bridge with Agnes and Tom Woodcock. When she didn't show up, her friends checked on her. At around 10 p.m., they found her car gone, which they later found in a shopping center parking lot nearby. The officers found blood on the driver's door in addition to a birthday gift wrapped up for a friend's son. They also found groceries and contents from Cindy's wallet. Oddly enough, her house appeared undisturbed. Tragedy struck on June 8, 1989, when a paving worker found Cindy's body in an abandoned house in Richmond. Her body was hogtied in a fetal position, the signature nylon stocking tied tightly around her neck, while her coat was lying near her body. The place where her body was discovered was quite busy with pedestrians. There was orange graffiti all over the walls. A line ran from the spot to where the body lay encircling it. The medical examiner commented that her body was tied so tightly that her finger was cut down to the bone. There was a needle mark on her inner right elbow. The forensic entomologist concluded that her body had begun decomposing as early as June 2, 1989. Her cause of death was said to be drug intoxication from morphine, diazepam, and fluorazepam. She had taken an estimated 20 to 80 tablets orally, yet the RCMP remained convinced that the cause of death was either suicide or an accident. Ozzie Cabin, her private investigator, believed that the blood had pooled on the left side of her body while she was lying on the right side, indicating that she had died elsewhere. Cindy's psychiatrist maintained that she had borderline personality disorder with elements of PTSD and that her childhood was laced with abuse. Could Cindy have been her own stalker? Is that why she would black out and not remember a thing? Many believe and speculate that the hoarse voice behind the recordings was that of a woman's trying to sound like a man. It's odd to say that Cindy would have self-inflicted seven years of incidents for attention, especially when she had people in her presence who heard the phone calls. Her coroner's inquest was the longest, most expensive inquest carried out by the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. It included over 80 witnesses and concluded that her death was caused by unknown reasons. Cindy James' death has been the most discussed mystery for web sleuths, yet nobody has been able to successfully figure out what truly happened to Cindy James. Can you solve this twisted mystery yourself? Let us know down below.